Betfair trading doesn't need to be complicated. If you follow a sequence of events, there's some logic behind what you're doing, and there's no reason why you can't make it work. And I maintain, despite my significant success over a number of years, most of what I do is relatively simple. I just do it particularly well. I execute to the best of my ability. Um, I've got a good feel for the markets. But most of the structure and the underlying logic of what I do is perfectly sensible when you lay it out. Now, uh, we've just gone through Ascot week and I thought I'd take the opportunity to grab some imagery on basically some of the trades that I've done. And I've picked on this one particular trade because you would have seen me talk about similar things in other videos. Um, and it is a good description basically of where an opportunity is and where a trade is within the market. So without further ado, let's have a look at this particular trade uh, that I did at Royal Ascot this week and exactly why I did it. If you're interested in learning to use BetAngel, head on over to our website where you can download a free trial. If you're interested in learning how to use it, then head over to the Bet Angel Academy where you can do exactly that. And if you want to talk to like-minded people, then head on over to our forum. So the first thing you should do when you turn up to market is make some sort of general assessment of the market that you're looking at. So on this particular occasion, we're at Royal Ascot, so you can tell that the race is going to be higher quality. And this race is a race for three-year-olds rated zero to 105. Um, it's a class two, which means that it is higher quality. Uh, the prize money and offer is £50,000 for the winner. Um, but also, it's a handicap race. So handicap races trade differently from maidens, for example. And the intention of a handicap is that all of the horses cross the line together. Uh, they are given additional weight according to their ratings. And therefore, um, it, that should sort of balance itself out. All of the horses should have a roughly equal chance of winning this particular race. So yeah, this is the race that we're looking at on this particular occasion. And the reason that we're looking at the type of race is because lots of different races and different grades will trade slightly differently. So if we dig a little bit deeper on this race, um, if we run over exactly what a handicap is and then look at these horses, you'll be able to get a better understanding of why handicaps are different from maidens. I have covered maidens in a separate video and the sort of characteristics that you're likely to see there. But in a handicap race, if you look at all of the horses, they'll be given an official rating. And the official rating uh, will go, uh, when you look at the race card, from the highest to the lowest. So if you're looking at a handicap, the horse that is carrying a saddlecloth one is basically the highest rated horse and therefore it will have to carry more weight than all of the others. As we go down that entire list what will happen is that the horse that is rated uh, second in the overall scheme of things will get the saddlecloth number two um, and that will carry a slightly lower weight than the top rated horse and so on. So basically as you go down the list the official rating will decline um, and therefore it will carry less weight than some of the other horses. But essentially when you look at a handicap the weight that they carry varies according to their official rating and the in intention is is that they want to give all of the horses a chance of potentially winning this race. Not all horses can perform at the highest level so they drop into handicap company and that gives them a chance to win some of these bigger prizes. So when you look at handicap races you can actually get a variety of different types of handicaps and we could get a very competitive handicap where all of the horses are priced at about the same within the market or well, sometimes you can get uncompetitive handicaps where the horse has been put out again quickly uh, before the handicapper has the chance to adjust the rating and therefore it will go off at a shorter price. But typically in some of these bigger competitive handicaps you would expect all of the prices to be roughly similar. It's a bookmaker's dream because trying to find a winner in these types of races is almost impossible. You know, do you go for the top weighted horse? Do you go for the bottom weighted horse uh, because it's carrying less weight? Well, essentially what should be happening is they should all have a roughly equal chance. It never quite works out like that in reality. Um, but we can turn up to this market and we would expect to see a market with maybe five or six horses at similar prices. And we should also expect to see the price activity within the market uh, being relatively flat because there's no way uh, to differentiate between each one of these horses. Um, so what happened when we first looked at this market? So when we turned up to this market we could see that there'd been a lot of support for one particular horse and whenever I turn up to a market I will always go across all of the charts because that's what I'm interested in seeing. Has there been support for something? Has the price drifted out somewhere else? And obviously charts are 
the easy and quick way of assessing that. You can see at an instant, basically, if something is being backed, something is being laid, or in fact, if the price is going absolutely nowhere. And when we turned up to this market, we could see that one horse had been backed fairly heavily. The price had come in a fair bit, and it appeared to have sort of reached a point within the market where people were no longer willing to back it. And that's quite logical because, of course, we're talking a handicap here where all horses should have an equal chance of winning. So when something gets backed in, there's no chance of it going off at incredibly short odds because, in theory, all of these horses should be crossing the line together. So when support comes in for something um, like this, then you sort of are more likely to see uh, that the market will stop backing it at some particular point. Um, and that presents us with our trading opportunity. So having looked at the charts, the next thing I do is look at the ladder because I'm interested in specifically how much money is being matched and where because that will give me a clue as to whether the backing is going to continue. If there's going to be continued support for this runner, then you see a different shape to the traded volume on the ladder. Basically, you'd see a sort of trail of, of smaller amounts matched and then most of the money matched right at the bottom. So if we see an accumulation of money at the bottom of the ladder, that indicates as that begins to pile up that perhaps the backing activity has begun uh, to fade away and therefore we've got the opportunity that maybe the price will actually bounce off of that and head back in the other direction. It's not uncommon in markets for them to go too far in either direction so what we're looking here is for that accumulation of volume and when that accumulation of volume um, appears then we're expecting that the price may not go any further. It doesn't mean that it definitely uh, will not but we're basically trying to stack things uh, gently in our favour. So using a combination of the ladder, where the money has been traded, and the chart to give us an indication as what's happened over a period of time, this can give us a strong or a weak signal in terms of what is likely to happen. And on this particular occasion, when we look at the chart, we can actually see that the price has come in, um, and then it's sort of flatlined at that particular point in time. So this is a good indication, along with the volume that you see on the ladder, that basically the price is unlikely to come in much further. Um, there's a, a drying up of support of backers at this particular price. Uh, so this could present an opportunity for us because we're expecting the price to either go sideways um, or perhaps to bounce back at some particular point. Uh, people who've backed at a higher price may get out, um, but basically that momentum that we see within the market has stalled. And that presents us with an opportunity to get into the market with a few lay orders. And the intention is, is that if the price does bounce out, then we can take advantage of that by laying at a lower price than we can back at. Now sometimes you also get another clue within the market and this is what exactly happened in this market. We didn't catch the exact bottom of this particular market but we did jump into the market at odds of five with a lay order on the basis that a large amount of money appeared um, just uh, below where we were active and looking within the market. We can see a massive order has appeared within this market. That can't be a back order because it would have pulled the price down. Therefore, we're assuming it's a lay order and therefore that is going to not only give us an indication that the price is going to go up, but also help us achieve that. Because if we can put our order in above that large order, then basically you can imagine it's going to take a lot of money to push the price down from that particular point onwards. So we had a favorable setup before, but seeing a large amount of money uh, in the market that's going to support our entry point within the market makes this a much, much better trade. Now, one of the things that you should be doing as a trader as well is as soon as you've entered the market, you should be exiting the market. And I know that sounds a bit strange, but I'm not saying, you know, uh, panic to get in, panic to get out. I'm saying establish a position in the market the way that you want to, and then establish where uh, you want to exit that position. And that should be in both directions. So you're basically saying, this is my entry point within the market. I think uh, the market is going to head up to this particular point, and therefore I'm going to put my exit trades around that particular point. And if the market goes against me, this is the point at which I'll get out. You should know exactly where you're going to get in and get out as soon as you open that trade. That's the way that you get a positive expectancy and that's the way that you can successfully manage a trade. So as soon as I enter the market, I put the closing positions at a point within the market that I think that they will get matched. So as our position begins to develop and mature within the market, we have to exit it at some point. So you've seen me uh, pitch the orders above where the current price is within the market. But there is one factor within here that you need to be aware of, and that is time. You should have set yourself up a window of opportunity within this market. So you're going to say, I'm going to enter the market around this point, and I'm going to exit at this particular point. So I will pitch orders where I think that they're likely to get matched. 
and as the market develops I'll make a judgment on whether I think those orders are going to get matched or whether they're not because I want to see the price heading towards those and starting to get those particular positions matched. But if that doesn't happen, then I'll start moving those orders down gently um, and getting them filled because it means that basically the position will net itself out or I may take a small loss. But what we're doing here is we're trying to create a position where those orders are likely to get matched. We're not sort of saying it's going to go up here and I'm going to pick the perfect point. We're just spreading those orders out and we're saying get those orders matched. Um, and then as that position matures, then we can basically exit at whatever price we think that we can get. And one of these factors is going to be the amount of time that you've got left in the market. So this trade I opened up fairly early on and I was basically looking to exit the market at about the two minute mark before all of the craziness happens within the market itself. And therefore that was going to be one of my factors as the clock slowly clicked down, uh, ticked down rather, to two minutes. Um, then if I didn't feel that those orders were going to get matched, then I would just gently pull them in and start to get them matched ahead of that particular time. The intention being to get into the market at a good opportunity. I've got a good idea of where I think the market is likely to go and where that, that um, price will head because as you've got a, a limited amount of time left in the market, the average move is going to get smaller and smaller that you could possibly get. And as we head closer and closer to the time where we must exit because we do not want to go and play, then basically I know that the chance of getting something five ticks away is going to get less and less. So I'll just pull those orders in and get them matched at the best available price at that point. Um, and that's exactly what we did here. We basically reached the point within the market where we we're trying to get all of those orders filled. Sometimes you get partially matched, but of course the net stake will show you what your net position is. So you'll put that final closing position into the market so that your net stake is zero. And then hey presto, your trade is complete. So once the trade has been complete, we are left with a gross amount within the market. And the reason for me often showing the um, unhedged amount and the hedged amount is because you should never forget that your objective really is based around the trade value that you're using. So, you know, we used a trade value of basically 600 pounds here. You've got to ignore the net exposure you have within the market because that's not important. You're focused on putting that £600 in the market, taking it out of the market and generating some profit within it because all of your profits and losses should be a percentage of that particular amount of money. So on this particular occasion, if we hedge that position, uh, which, is, which you should obviously always do, um, then you'll see that that represented about 10% of our total stake. So if we could repeat this trade 10 times, even if we had the most disastrous trade on planet Earth, um, we've basically ensured uh, with the, all of those positive trades uh, that over the course of the day we, we couldn't possibly lose. Because trading is a balance of profits and losses and sometimes you break even and sometimes things don't work out the way that they should do. But if you sit and wait for the right opportunity, then there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to trade it profitably. And your assessment of how well you've done should be based on the fully hedged amount against the stake that you used, not your total exposure, just that stake, because you're managing that stake, you're putting it in the market, you're taking it out of the market, and you should be taking a profit with it. You're not going to achieve that every time. But basically, when you get a successful trade, you could sort of bank that really, and when you get the occasional loss, or you, the trade just doesn't work out, and you end up exiting for zero, you're basically, it's the accumulation of all of those total trades that matter at the end of the day. And as long as you keep that trade in proportion, to the level of stake that you're using, then that should see you through to long-term profitability. So let's look at a chart of um, that entire period that we're active and trading within the market. Uh, we saw the price come in, it was a competitive handicap. Uh, we typically wouldn't expect to see that within a competitive handicap. So we're looking for signs that maybe the price had bottomed and people were not willing to back it anymore. That's exactly what we saw. And then from that particular point onwards, we saw that accumulation of volume on the ladder. We saw the price activity on the chart stall um, that we felt more comfortable putting a lay bet in there because we were expecting it to bounce up at some point. We didn't know how far, but we were expecting it not to go any further down. We got another significant clue when the large lay order appeared in, within the market because all we did was pop our order on top of that and we anticipated that maybe the person wanted to get the lay order filled, we gradually push that price up and try and get it filled. That's exactly what we saw, because if we look at when we're closing our position, we can still see a large amount of money sitting below us within that particular market. 
The reason that we put those trades there is because we felt we had a good chance of getting them matched on our closing positions. And in fact, when we look at the chart um, around the period that we we're exiting within the market, you can see that it pretty much flatlined at about six. So we got that just about right. If we were unable to judge particularly where we expected that trade uh, to go, we would basically put a range of orders in there and we would focus on getting that net stake back to zero by the time we reached our, uh, our closing window within this particular market. When you're actively trading, you don't sort of, you know, ride a position out forever. You're basically getting a good average entry and a good average exit. And I've tended to find that over a period of time, that's the best way to trade because you're either perfect or a lie. You cannot get the perfect entry and the perfect exit. So you're sort of putting your positions in the market where you roughly feel that it makes sense. And that's exactly what we did on this occasion. So hopefully you've been able to learn a bit more about what happened within this trade and why. I have discussed each one of these individual points, such as the staking, uh, when you're going to get in the market, spreading your exit to get out, um, and all of those sort of factors in other videos. And I thought that of all of the different trades that I captured this week, this was quite a good example of many different aspects of it because we've got a clear opportunity within this market. Um, the setup uh, was pretty neat. It was confirmed by some of the activity within the market and the exit was done about right as well. So I hope that this will give you a bit more confidence when you see this sort of pattern again in the future. And I hope that this video has been useful for you.